Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Savannah Bailey McLean, and I am the executive director of the West Harlem Park Club. Welcome to our exhibition space, NP10 on Governor's Island. And joining me today for the panel, Invisible No More, to my left, is Ileana Emilia Garcia, Craig Blue, and Diane Smith. And we are doing this panel in partnership with the International Sculpture Center for their uh, year-round panels that they're doing beginning this fall. So we're going to get started and let me just introduce the panelists and tell you a little bit about them. So, starting with Ileana, she is a native of the Dominican Republic. She now lives and works in Brooklyn and she is an installation artist. Then we have Craig Blue, who is Bronx-born, a mixed media artist, and a surfer. He loves to tell people he likes to surf. <laughs> and then we have Diane Smith, also Bronx-born. There's three of us who are Bronx-born, because I'm Bronx-born too. Uh, she is of Belize descent, she lives and works in Harlem, and she is an interdisciplinary artist. So we are here to talk about uh, artists who are black, indigenous, people of color, uh, primarily in the United States, who are sculptors. And what we are here to share is that um, these artists are now coming to the forefront in America. Not so much in the past, but they are today, and we are kind of the reason why they're coming to the forefront, because if we don't talk about them, if we don't showcase their works, then unfortunately their works kind of go in vain. So sit back, enjoy, interact with us, ask questions, let's have some fun. So I'm going to ask each of the artists to briefly tell us the artists that they wish to discuss with us yeah, so I'm going to start off with Eliana. Uh, actually, uh, there are so many people to pick from. Uh, but uh, for this panel, I pick uh, Jorge Luis uh, Rodriguez from Puerto Rico and Nick Cave uh, from Missouri. Uh, the reason I pick them is because I've been in this to like they are both uh, work with installations that became like part, part, part of a theater. Everything is out of a costume about making very whimsical forms. But at the same time, they have that connection with the um, design. Mm -hmm. uh, Rodriguez was actually working at the testing company, and he actually has a background in design, even though his master is in sculpture, from NYU, by the way. Uh, and he works with fashion. He's the director of the graduate program at the School of Arts in Chicago. But I like the fact that their work, different uh, practices, they work with collaboration, with other disciplines. Everything is about community. And I always, I tell people like you know you when you are a sculptor, but then you also work with music, with fashion, with everything else. You become interdisciplinary, and then you bring people in, and that's you could be a community with your artwork. That doesn't mean that you not do your work, but you know that idea of uh, a family of talents. Both of them have been very strong about it, and I like to defend the design part of it because it's only again. Uh, skill, added skill. It's nothing, it doesn't make the less. In the contrary, it actually fits each other. So that's why I think that. Now, Craig, tell us who you chose for today. The two artists that I really admire, among many, um, but that my work really um, is inspired by, are um, John Otterbridge from Los Angeles and Doris Salcedo from uh, Colombia. And um, she is a graduate of NYU, which is awesome. And I've chosen these two artists because one with John Otterbridge, um, we have some similarities within our heritage. His family's from Georgia. Um, his father, like my father, would um, tinker with things and found objects. My dad, at one point, um, in his as an entrepreneur, would collect junk and resell junk. My father was a mechanic. If he had more education, he would have been like some type of mechanical engineer or a statistician because he had a fine mind for invention and numbers and measurements. And um, I find that now I'm going back into that 
um, into that history of my own personal history into my artwork um, using found objects. And Doris Salcedo, in that same vein, um, using chairs and cement and found objects to create these narratives. And both of them uh, speak about social political um, concepts and context in their work. And I'm, I'm political. I'm social political. I think about my community. My art is for everyone, but it directly relates to histories in my community, um, being from the Bronx, black and Latino, Latino histories and things that I know of. So I like to make altars. And these two artists sort of represent those type of things in their artwork and that I'm very inspired by. Um, and yeah, they are just like a sort of silent mentors. Doris Salcedo being my shero, and John Otterbridge, having met him as well when I lived in Los Angeles, and having worked in the California African American Museum, looking, you know, looking at ex exhibitions of his work, I was just like totally inspired. I was like, that's that's fun. That's a lot of fun. Thank you. Okay, Diane. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I am going to be speaking about three artists. Um, and I'm going to intersect them, so not specifically one or the other. But I am focused on Chakai Booker, Barbara Chase Rabode, and Mary Hassinger. I chose these three women for very personal reasons. Uh, Chakai has been uh, not only a mentor, but she's like a big sister to me. And through Chakai, I met Mary Hassinger while I was in grad school, actually, and I was looking for artists to sort of reference. And I was making a, a, a real point to not reference the norm, which is Eurocentric, um, the Eurocentric images and aesthetics that's usually put forth for us to reference. And in looking, I came up with Marin Hassinger. And I happened to be in class that day with my laptop up. And Chakaya Inbox sent me an email and said, Marilyn Hassinger would like to meet you. <laughs> so um, I since um, had the opportunity to become friends with Marin, spend lots of time with her. Barbara Chase Rabode, I know the least of the three. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be in very intimate um, settings with her on numerous occasions. What I am interested in in all of their work is the majesty of their work and the audacity to be as women of color and to create uh, the monuments, the monumental pieces that they do, whether they're inside or outside, but the audacity to and without the permission to do so. And entering into a space of that level of creativity that again rivals or rubs against what we know as art, or what we have been seeing in the canon of art history, that um, again it, it it runs against Eurocentric aesthetics. Okay. Now the artist I wish to focus on today is Preston Singleton, and I happened to see Preston's work not too far from here at the Smithsonian Museum of the Native American. Uh, a building at the Custom House by Bowling Green. And um, it's great to go into that building. It's a beautiful building. And I decided to go in to see the exhibition. And when I went in, I was struck because I've seen Native American art before, but it was the first time I saw it in glass. And I thought that was spectacular. Now, the culture that he focuses on is a lingot. And uh, he uses glass blowing and focuses on Northwest Native art. And what also really struck me was that the works reminded me, and he does reference that, totem poles. And the totem poles uh, from his culture, uh, which is really in Alaska, parts of Alaska, uh, in the northwest portion of um, North America, they use symbols of many animal symbols, bears, wolves, whales. And he was able to etch all of those animals in glass. What I also loved about his work was that um, the totems, the symbolisms in most of the totems, will tell you about a person's family. 
the histories of their clan, perhaps. And I was really taken aback because personally, I have been researching my family's history for the last three decades, trying to learn as much as I can. So I felt this sort of kinship about the symbols in his glass works and how they beautifully tell these very good stories. Now, what's also great is that he took European uh, skills to further his own culture's story. So he learned to glass blow in Seattle, but he also learned Scandinavian design. He also learned the secrets of Venetian glass masters. And then he was able to incorporate all of that in his works. Uh, he also deals with sand carvings as well. So they're quite beautiful, stunning, and the pieces that I like the most that I'll share with you is called Guardian of the Sea, which is now uh, a part of the collection of the Brooklyn Museum. Killer whales visit the Thunderbird and a canoe. And these beautifully colored glass works tells these various uh, stories that I think uh, showcase how what we've been taught from children is not true, and that uh, Columbus did not discover America. People were already here, living thriving lives, a part of uh, really extensive communities, and they were constantly sharing back and forth uh, with other groups of people. So um, I just thought he was distinctive for sharing Native American culture, language, symbolism, but in glass. So now we're going to get to a heavy section of this conversation. And that is two days ago, not really surprising. They could have just called me out. <laughs> <laughs> not surprising at all. They discovered that the lion's share of monuments in the United States are comprised of white males, and very few. Surprise, surprise, surprise. <laughs> okay. So we want to share with each other our reactions, because this uh, study has become very hot. In the last couple of days, the uh, uh, funders for the study, the Mellon Foundation, feels it's very important that people know about that this audit took place, that we should be discussing it, and I feel like those who would be most impacted by this should have a conversation about it. So we're going to spend a couple of minutes to briefly talk about that and also the history of public art in the United States. So does anyone want to chime in first? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> that's interesting to me. Um, let's talk about this from a, for a moment from the perspective of systemic racism and um, understanding what that really means. So these kinds of things, you wouldn't necessarily connect a monument with systemic racism. But when you think about it, black and brown people are made to move through their daily lives with these visuals and constant reminder of the oppression and the pain. So that's a different level of trauma that's in, embedded in our cities, in our states, that we have to move through our communities with. So there's the, already the trauma of the things that happen day to day. But oftentimes people say, I don't understand what systemic racism and it doesn't exist. But all of these things are rooted in that, right? When monuments that, that really depict the atrocities from slavery, I mean, from the stealing of land, and the massacre of thousands and millions of people on a daily basis, and it's from school to our day-to-day -day lives, we are made to embrace, celebrate, and acknowledge this as part of American history, but then we are invisible to a certain degree in that history. But we are, still, we are very visible. Because those monuments and those men who are depicted as heroes are heroes based on the backs of our ancestors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
how to okay. do it. <laughs> Come on, it's, it's, it's this story where, the, where you realize that the history is actually uh, told by whoever thinks one. And it's, we, we grew up thinking that you know, these people are heroes when they're actually, they're not. But you, like you said, we spend everyday life looking at these role models that are not models and they are not good roles, thinking that they're better. And that's actually those most like ancestry memory. You, we grow and keep going with this memory of like, you know, we are not there, like that's supposed to be like the success. So it's, it's, I mean, that hour it wasn't necessary to spend the money on that because we know that. We said it everywhere, even you read a history book. Like, you know. Well, I mean, but you have that, um, this kind of um, dissecting, right? Yeah. But then you have states like Texas that says, we're going to take things out of the history book that directly reflects enslaved Africans. And some of the, you, you understand what I'm saying? So it, it's a it's a very interesting thing. Those same people are fighting to keep those sculptures and those monuments alive. Well, then let me mm -hmm. just go back to and please do uh, chime in too, Craig. These monuments, most of them, began after the Civil War, right? Mm -hmm. And it was to perpetuate. Uh, the South's uh, lost cause. Mm -hmm. And the lost cause was this sort of um, fictionalized version of the outcome of the Civil War, that the South actually did not lose the war, that somehow they were outnumbered and they were outgunned and man. Recontextualized. Okay. <laughs> and so therefore they, you know, they didn't have what was necessary to to win. But if you don't have enough ammunition and if you don't have enough he supplies, lost. then that you means lost the you lost the war. <laughs> and so therefore the lost cause, which was perpetuated, believe it or not, by women the daughters of the Confederates, uh, who are still around to this day. Mm -hmm. They are still here. And so therefore, you perpetuated you know, these myths about battle victories and the people who participated in these wars so that you can not feel the pain of loss and the consequences of those loss because before uh, Lincoln had died, and when they were discussing reuniting the country, it was understood that in order to come back into the United States, because technically the southern states were not a part of the United States anymore, that they had to recognize that slavery had indeed ended. But they had these monuments to kind of show otherwise. What do you think about that, Craig? Okay. So, I'm pretty clear about my politics dealing with America and understanding the history of America. And it's a horrible history steeped in genocide, steeped in systemic racism that still exists today. So these monuments after the Civil War were to regale the Southern loss. Like, hey, even though we lost, here goes General Lee, here goes whomever they decided to put up, especially the young man asked me about down south today. You know, I have a love, you know, it's, a, it's a very difficult relationship to have. Even the relationship to calling myself an American is a difficult relationship to say because of the atrocities, you know, done in the name of America, but then in my name with my tax dollars. So we'll go past that. Let's stick to the art. So when they put up these monuments, I also have, I, I'm, I'm torn, and not really even torn, I want some of them to stay up because that reminds me of where I'm at and it's traumatic. But I want to remember that these are the horrible things done. But then I want our people and our histories to be put up like you said, the U.S. Customs House. The U.S. Customs House has four statues up, four monuments. The last monument, one is of Europe, Asia, um, Africa, and I forget the other continent. But they have continents that are represented as women. And the last woman is Africa. 
And if you go and look at that very carefully, you will see that the monument of Africa is naked. Now what does that say subconsciously? You know, what does that say subliminally? That Africa has been stripped, you know? And if you look at all the things around the monument, it speaks that Africa has been stripped. We are going to strip this, na this nation, this country bare. And all the other monuments have other symbols that recognize its, you know, its industrialism, its history, its rise in power, like England, Europe. It, it's, its foot is on the, the its, its foot is on the world. That's very symbolic. So monuments represent symbolic conquering, you know, most of the time of those who conquer. So of course Texas wants to delete or say that Africans came to America as immigrants looking for work. That's oh, not true. Right. <laughs> he said from interns. <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's absolutely that's... not true. And so that's why I, I I don't mind some monuments staying up because it reminds me to keep fighting. Mm -hmm. I want monuments of Africans and to indigenous people and Latinx people to be added for the contributions, mm -hmm. even the revolutionary contributions. Like there should be just as many monuments of Malcolm X and Marcus Garvey as there are of Martin Luther King. Just as many monuments of Muhammad Ali, who was actually very revolutionary in every in choosing to become a nation of Islam, in choosing not to go to the Vietnam War. There should be multiple monuments. Because he gave up his career saying that he was not going to go into the Vietnam War and kill other people of color. Those are deep. So if there's 191 monuments of Abraham Lincoln, there should be 50 monuments of Cesar Chavez mm -hmm. everywhere. There should be, you know, 50 monuments of, you know? You know? Well, no, no, no. No, no, I was thinking, to add to what you said, I was thinking of what you were talking, I love that idea of like, instead of taking the moment, the monuments down to add them, just because we really do it, if we take them down, we really start they doing exactly what they're doing to us, erasing us. If we, it's, no, it's if, strange. You, know, you gotta pick and choose. I get where you guys are going with that, um, but I, I, I honestly don't see it that way. Like, I don't need, I don't need the monument to remind me. Because every day, you I'm reminded. Okay. This doesn't change. But yeah, wait, I just want to talk about one monument in particular. Because a few years ago, if you remember the controversy about Christopher Columbus right. and Indigenous Day, I was invited to a meeting. Uh, a few people were to talk to the young people who were pressing to get the monument taken down. So we were there, and in fact, the young man in charge was doing the diets, which I thought was an ingenious, an ingenious way of protest, where they were laying down in Grand Central Station and the police did not know what to do. I thought it was genius. But nonetheless, as we were talking with them, uh, and they were talking about, you know, how this is about supremacy, the group that was with me, we kind of reminded them of the history of how Christopher Columbus Day started. And it happened to be about the largest mass lynching in the United States, in New Orleans, but not of Africans, of Italians. And they were accused, here this part, of killing a police officer. And then they were found innocent of killing that police officer, but the mob still went after them lynched them all. It was 11 men. And it was the Irish who was watching who felt so sorry for the Italians, another group of immigrants, that they wanted to help. And that's how the Knights of Columbus began. And then it started as a day before it turned into a holiday. Now, I'm not saying I'm a proponent of Christopher Columbus. But what was happening was that they could not find a symbol to represent Italian mm -hmm. heritage. And they wanted to say that they were a part of America like everybody mm -hmm. else who was coming. So the only symbol they could find was Columbus. Now we all agree we were trying to say, and the city did agree with us, 
was that let's keep it. Let's keep the monument of Christopher Columbus, but expand upon it so people understand the full story, so therefore they can understand how it all began and how Columbus impacted all of the indigenous people in the Caribbean and in the America. Tell a more broader, truthful story than the one that has been taught to all of us. And that would be more faith. So I'm just saying I agree with all of you that yes, you know, America's history is not that pleasant in the least and we do need to broaden the narrative. But getting back to our topic, which is about artists of color who are sculptors, one of the things that folks are saying is that modern public art began in the 1960s which I disagree with. I think it started even further back during FDR's period as uh, president. But they're saying at that time, the nation was trying to move forward away from traditional European aesthetics and be more inclusive. So I wanted to ask you if you felt that way because our reason for being here today is to talk about the fact that artists of color are still considered invisible. So did the country actually move forward? And if it did, did artists of color help push that forward? Well, I, I feel like I did. Because we, you know, we, we had days. We, we had days. all know each other very well. <laughs> well one, I hear everything that you're saying, Savannah, and I think that that to pay homage to that particular incident is definitely something that should be done. But we're living in an era and time where we know better, we do better. And a, a sculpture or a monument like Christopher Columbus could be replaced yes. with something else in today's time. And if you think about, like, yes. how are you not going to think about, I mean, if you go through the Met, the Greek and Roman sculptures, and da, 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 da. I mean, like, you can find other things to do. So I don't think it's specifically that. And I don't think that um, there needs to be a reminder in the, in the sense of the monument for what has happened in this country in that way. Mm -hmm. And to, you know, if there's 190 sculptures of, of aid, then 50, no, if we're gonna talk about equity and inclusion, let's talk about equity and inclusion. And let's talk about fairness. Then then what's equitable, then all parts of America is represented in an equitable way. Okay, that's fair. That's, that's, that's fair. fair. That's I would change, like, Chris Columbus Circle, gone. You know, or that monument, that statue of the guy, the first, um, gynecologist, like that needs to leave and we replace it with a Harry Tubman and a Aretha Franklin. No, like, already you know, so, yes, already yeah, done. Done. Yeah. So, but yeah, I know. So we take things, like I'll be very specific, like picking and choosing, like we don't need any more general leads. That could be gone. But there are some young people who don't know about general leads. And they should know. They should know. You know the horrific. So you know it would be. But to, I, it, to give anything that you give that much, and a monument to, to get, we'll get back to your point, even your question, Savannah. To give something the space of being a monument does not speak to it in the fact of it being a negative thing. You're sure. holding it up. You're holding it in a particular regard. So collectively. There has to be a better way, and that's from my education system, right? So we're talking about places like Texas. You know, that's a whole other. So it's not the monument itself that has to be there in order for us. It's like asking people to continually live in all aspects of their lives in trauma, so someone else can learn something. Makes no sense. But see, yeah. when you talk about Lee, what's interesting about Robin? Robert E. Lee said in his lifetime he did not want any monuments in his honor. So that's number one. But what really captures me about Robert E. Lee, he and Ulysses S. Grant were both graduates of West Point. Both served in the Mexican-American War. Both, who ended up being on the Union and Confederate side, said that what we did to Mexico was a tragedy. 
we took northern Mexico. There was no war. There was no aggression from Mexico. They just went in and took northern Mexico, killed women and children, and both said that was wrong. So what I'm saying is there's more complexity to the history and the people. And what I'm saying is not right or wrong, but I think we need to have these dialogues because the story is far more layered than what it ha what has been given to us. That's all I'm just trying to say. Let's be clear of some things. And, you know, a person saying, like you just said, what they said about Mexico does not erase <laughs> the mountain, mountain of ways in which they were brutal men. They were not nice men. And one, you know, it's sort of like for me when I hear people talk about me and how, you know, people are like, oh, we can't. I'm like, but I remember when he passed away of cancer, which was tragic, because he opposed Trump. Now we have McCain in some like revered state, but I was like, you know, we have to be clear on how we're processing things. And I think that's one of the problems with America on a whole is because we, we live in a space of optics and things appear a certain way at a particular moment that becomes the truth of the moment or the thing that we lift up and then everything else gets pushed aside. So I think we have to be careful. Yes, yeah, sometimes people say, say things that are beneficial, that are right, that are just, but then we cannot ignore all the other things. And that does not mean that you now deserve a monument or you should have one. Oh, I agree. I agree. But let's get back to um, your question about where we stand today as um, artists of color and these artists that we're talking about. I think first and foremost, the visibility that we're seeing is first and foremost rooted in economics. Yes. Because nothing moves anything like money. That's absolutely and, right. And then second to that, I'm going to say probably this idea of when globalization and the internet and all of those things became more um, user viable in our day-to-day -day lives. That is what shifted this idea of economics attached to black and brown artists as makers. Because there was more visibility, you could see more things. They were, there was this more, there was an easier exchange of things. There were artists going over to Europe, um, you know, from, I mean, Ed Clark and uh, Henry Oswald. I mean, Henry Oswald. Since the 30s, 40s. Right, they've been going, but they were treated it as the anomaly. It was just, that it can't be no more than this one. There was no um, economic, nor was there aesthetic nor was there intellectual value attached to work made by people of color. It could not be as significant, it could not be as important. We could not have anything to say. We could not lend to culture in that way. But when you look at um, Cubism, when you look at the work of Modigliani, when you look at, I mean, I can go down the list. You can draw the parallels, talk about sculpture, <laughs> um, from African sculpture. You can draw the parallels, and I think um, what the Bond Foundation, is it the Bond Museum? And the Bond Museum in Philly does a really great job of juxtaposing these European artists with African sculpture, and you can really see the intersections between the two and how these things were, were taken um, from those. So while on, a, on, a, on the outward, we were not considered diasporic, of any significance or importance. Artists who were makers understood the aesthetic value because that's where they drew from. But then it's also very interesting that now as black and brown people who go into um, academic programs and to study sculpture and, uh, and all of these things, you are made to study Eurocentric works of art. And when they have taken their aesthetic from the diaspora, so it's just a very crazy thing. I mean, I'm classically trained as a sculptor using white bodies, primarily as my models in Laguna Beach. 
sample. <laughs> I mean, and the outlook and the program, the syllabus was all around classical sculpture, which in turn means European sculpture. And that's, you know, then through the years, we as African Americans have not only learned that, then we expanded on it, which is why we've chosen the artists that we've chosen because those artists took sculpture yes. and like all the things in the indigenous person's hand, they morphed it, yes. they put some soul to it, and they yes. infused it with an ancestry and, a, and a, almost an innate DNA ancestry that takes it outside. Like, yeah, I can do the human form, but watch this. Mm -hmm. You know, let me put some jazz to that, that, that and put some swing. Where we were even least um, considered comparable was in the space of abstraction mm -hmm. and being abstract, right? So from, from abstract e expressionist painting to even this idea of creating a sculpture from the abstract that had some narrative co connected to it and, and it had some sort of contextual um, uh, messaging rooted in it, whether the socio-political, uh, economical, it was, it, it couldn't be. But when you look at artists like Chakaya Booker, mm -hmm. who's using tires to make monumental pieces, she just put a piece at, um, what is it, o Oklahoma Contemporary Art Center, mm -hmm. and this thing is massive, it's like 70 feet, and I happen to know she does this herself. Like, there's not a team of students, because I'm actually on the phone with her when she's doing She does it herself and her partner, Austin. They do this work, and it, to watch her manifest this, it's almost like she is calling up the ancestors. I believe that she is standing on the shoulders, and they're they are coming through her, because for the years and the centuries of not being visible and not having voice, so now we have artists like Ja'Kaya Booker, Marin Hassinger, and Robert Chase Rabot, who are unapologetically creating from this space of black female identity is is amazing and lucky for me um, that I now have this to look to because when I was in grad school I was black I did not look at Eurocentric art as a right now this I did not I did not consider that I did not look at any of that and I was told that my work was too aesthetic and the artists I was looking at was too aesthetic because they were all aesthetic. <laughs> and, and from from Carnival to what you now consider African art, which was rooted in its aesthetic, which was its utilitarian purpose, was part of was the aesthetic. aesthetic is what y'all call African art. So this is the space in which I'm going to create from. Now I understand from your universal lens why, why you are here. Because you don't understand me nor my culture. You think you do because you read a book, you had a conversation at a party, you saw a documentary, and now you proceed to tell me my own, my own life, my own story. My own story because it doesn't represent what you think it should. Right, yep, right. And, I, and <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly, but you know, we speak some of the same language. And when I went to Cuba, and having Cubans, because I've been studying what is called African religions, Yoruba, Santeria, Candomblé in Brazil, Voodoo in Haiti, and understanding what their stories, so-called mythologies, to realize origins. And the Cuban people told me, this religion is from Africa. And just yeah, that's it. it is from the Yoruba, it is from the Congo, end of story. Many of the names, many of the stories are all African. With our own take yeah. on it and transcribing it through our experience. But this is African. So forget all that Christianity, forget all that Catholic stuff. And I embraced it, and it's coming out through this unseen voice deep inside. And I mix it up, make a little gumbo, mm -hmm. little jambalaya, mm -hmm. with, the, with then using people like John Otterbury, mm -hmm. but also Robert Rauschenberg, mm -hmm. Leonardo Drew, Mark oh, Curie, um, the Astrid Gates, contemporaries, mm -hmm. but then also looking at 
you know, those artists who now know ancestors from the past, and it all sort of putting this together and this contextualized idea of whom I'm also developing to be that was not told to me during school. All these things I had to learn about myself as one and a person of African descent in America. And the books I've had to read, W.E.B. Du Bois, The Art of Africa, Malcolm X, Art of Africa, Free of, I mean, Jim Brown, you know, and to understand how we've all been sort of subjugated in the ideas of ourselves. And that in, even in the 21st century, in a 20th century art historical book, the only artist they can talk about is Jop, is Basquiat. Pretty much because of the economics of it. So I had to find. And then artists like Colin Chase introduced me to Doris Sade, yes. Salcedo. Right. Um, introduced me to my in um, California, the Chicano artist, meeting Margaret Garcia and understanding and meeting Chicano artists and understanding their legacy mm -hmm. and then that intertwined with our legacy. And in Cuba, their monuments are ginormous. Mm -hmm. They are monumental. So we can take that little General Lee, and we can chop, chop, chop his head off until he's like, Lord, hey. And then we put a, a, a Muhammad Ali, the size of that Rocky sculpture oh, in like Philadelphia. Yeah. Replace that with, you know, move Rocky over <laughs> and put Muhammad Ali, because truly he is the greatest, one of the greatest. Or Joe Johnson, you know, Jack Johnson, or any one of them. You know, I go down history lane of artists, musicians that need monuments. And fortunately, now, I don't know why Carnegie Mellon, they needed to do an audit to tell us something and use $250 million, but I know between the three of us right here, one million here, one million here, one million here, and we got a sculpture. You know how they find So Carnegie Mellon is listening to this ICS, the ISC podcast. We could use the grant money and we'll create the monuments that need to be seen and you can push over those other white monuments, those Confederate map flag monuments. I'll take, take it down over Kirk Russia and put up the monuments of our people that speak to jazz, that speak to the invention of the street light, that speak to, you know, like that, that speak to construction and you know innovations in science that we don't, but we still don't know about. And there's still like we I still have to look outside of my nieces and nephews' history books mm -hmm. to find Latinx, black, Caribbean inventors and scientists and people who think, even with surfing. Surfing was not started by white culture. Well, and, and you know, there, there's a thing. I'm just saying. You never know. <laughs> well, I just want to also say that the Black Panther Party is not Uh, class, New York City coastline, past, present, and future. So I would like to invite any of those students. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Any questions for us? Yes. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Um, uh, so I have, a, I have a question, um, and and mind me as I kind of like map it out. Um, so, like in economics and finance, going to like the economics of art, uh, there's this term like the emerging economies, which is like kind of, you know, in business schools now, it's a rebrand of like that exploitative colonialist project <laughs> in in third world countries, sort of seeing them as another mechanism of, of economic exploitation. So, I guess putting that in the context of art, I'm wondering whether you see like, especially in a post. Uh, BLM, Black Lives, um, you know, the movement for Black Lives, whether you see um, in a largely white controlled art industry um, a similar sort of exploitation going on now of black artists to sort of like the interests of, you know, white gallery owners or like the white artist elite. Um, complicated question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ladies, I said ladies okay. first, go away. Well, um, I, got you, I got you back. Excuse me. There's a, um, there's a documentary I want to recommend. Um, you may or may not have um, seen or heard of this. Um, it's called System K. And System K is about artists in the Congo and the ways in which they make and they have to make because in this part of the Congo, um, they have nothing. There are no materials except for all of the waste that ends up in the landfills there. 
And they are the epitome of what artists are for me. And it had me question my own ability to make, my privilege in the ability to make. Because we had artists on that, on, in that country making work and to get new, they were burning plastic from the landfill. And I just thought about that. If I burn one piece of plastic today, do I be dead tomorrow? Because my constitution just couldn't handle it. <laughs> but this is what they are doing for the work. And they make very political, then um, Kinsasha, they make very political work. And it's for themselves and their communities because they, in this particular area, they don't have a lot of um, outlets. But now people are, because of System K, I would think, I would dare say, um, people are now going into Kinsasha and finding these artists. I haven't done any deep dive in really figuring out what that looks like for them economically, but I know it's happening. And that does concern me, just as it concerns me that in places like Haiti, the Masha and the women who would sit on the side of the road and cook or make trinkets, um, people come back and big designers come back with the bangles and the yes. desk and they yep. sell it for X amount of dollars. Mm -hmm. And then you have to think about how that trickles down. You know why those economies don't change or move? Because those artisans are told what they should make. So you go and you say, oh, it costs $5 to send one kid to school. It costs $15 to feed you for the month. Water costs this. So this is what you're going to get paid. Imagine any of you going to apply for a job, and the job says to you, oh, let's see, maybe you spent $150 on those sneakers. Um, it should cost you about $300 to eat a month. Your rent should be about $750. Okay, so this is what I'm going to pay. Would you be okay with that? But this is what happens in those places that you're talking about. And so the economy can't grow. Family capital cannot be built in that way. And these are viable artisans that are not really under the guise of helping, under the guise of allyship, under the guise. But this is what, hap what happens. And to a certain degree, um, there's an African artist where um, and I will send you the info so that you can share with him where something similar has happened, where how his work was being exploited and changed, and, and it just turned into this big fiasco. So it is something that we have to be very cognizant of in the now, because there is a commodifying of blackness right now. Yes. <laughs> that is historically, right? And you can, you can see it when you look at the auction house at Swan. I remember when Swan wasn't dealing Black art. Now, in the 90s, there was something called the Black Fine Art Show. It was done at the Puck Building. And this is when all of the major black artists came out. The dealers, because they were always dealers that dealt black art. They saw, they, saw, they saw the money in it. And with the Black Fine Art Show, it really put what people started calling the secondary market on the forefront. And then you had auction houses like Swan doing programming and then and I kept saying, they're coming for you. And now that quote unquote secondary market is a money maker for a gal for an auction house like Salon. Christie's, all of them are now dealing. What was it? The um uh what's his name that was at uh Met the Met Brewer? His piece. Oh, hey. Okay. Carrie James Marshall. Carrie James Marshall. Marshall going for 12 million, <laughs> you know? But here's the thing, when an artist sells work like that, generally, no monies yes. come to the artist. Yes, yes, that's true. Or the community. Or the community, Just, right? Yeah. It is happening between the auction house and the person who purchased and the person who owned it. But it does not trickle down to the artist. So I think with this commodifying of blackness, that collectively a conversation needs to shift in how we protect ourselves as artists. Well, there is a new movement now to say that when a work sells again, that the artist should get a percentage of that right. sale because uh, they lose out. It just keeps exploding, but the artist receives nothing. But let's move on to another question. Yes. Um, so I used to something that 
I've been thinking about for a while. And I guess it started when I learned about Great, Great Zimbabwe and how the when the explorers went down there and uh, immediately said, well, this could not have been African. It's too good. Mm -hmm. And uh, then Rhodes and his men like stole the uh, uh, ornamentation from it, took it back to their places, while well, at the same time saying, "This is this is clearly European. No, no thing of value has ever been created by Africans." Um, between um, white Europeans viewing African diasporic art, black diasporic art, as just less valuable inherently, but also wanting it for themselves, like wanting to buy it. There's this great need, like, like, urge to always have it. It's, 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 it's called envy. envy. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. No, but envy, you have to understand envy. Envy is about wanting what somebody else has. And in order to get what they have, you have to destroy that person so that you can claim it as your own. So that has been a consistent theme in human nature for quite some time once the transatlantic slave trade began. There was always slavery from the beginning of time, but people did not enslave people the way we know it today. It was because of wars and I other, yes. yes, conflicts, but they always embraced those who lost the war and embraced them in their village or their tribe. It wasn't about treating them as an object. It wasn't until the 15th century when you had Europeans going west discovering that there were these additional lands um, that had lots of resources that then they decided that they just wanted to take what somebody else had. So it's about envy. And empowerment. I mean, yeah, empowerment and ownership is just about owning, right? So I just talked about the commodifying of blackness. That's what that is. It's just about ownership. And the more you own, the more power you have over the thing, and I always talk about how it seems like um, this idea of blackness, our identity being rented from <laughs> the masses, you know, because our swag, our, like, our, our language, our movement, everything gets gets watered down and trickled. And when you hear newscaster using vernacular that comes out of Harlem, now, you know, um, it, it, it is that thing, you know, it's, it's, it's appropriation, appropriation and commodification. So his question is, is relative to your question about the economics of it. Because in a certain way, like, there was a moment where, you know, deaf poetry, black medians, black poets, you know, slam poetry, all that, how it came and there was a time for it, and the so-called movement for it, and it got commodified with like deaf poetry jam and things like that. Now you don't hate it. Well that was that was no no. <laughs> that was that was being that, that was, was no, that was being no. but they also you know they they capitalized on a moment in time which was great because it was run and overseen by men of color, people of color. But like, you know, now if you look there's a trend towards, you know, towards East Indian and you will see this more and more. You're gonna see more East Indian artists being put into the forefront and East Indian art being bought. So it changes and it's not due to people of color having a say in what changes. It's basically the collectors and the gallery owners and the museums. The museums are trying to be, you know, they're talking about diversity and equity and, and inclusion. <laughs> well, we have to see how that expands and expands by actually including the voices of the people in the community so to lift those economies up and you know to be more inclusive of artists and curators and gallery owners of color and be like you know what's coming what do you see what do you want you know not just you know there are levels you know we have to redefine what you're saying what inclusiveness is so if we redefine what inclusiveness is then perhaps we can make that impact in the world of sculpture. Let's just do one more question. Does anyone else have a question? Okay. Well then, uh, we're going to start to wrap this up. And I just wanted to thank everybody for being here today and talking about these various artists. Why don't you repeat for everyone the artists that you want 
to reference um, us to learn more about. Yes. Chikaya Booker, spelled C H A K A I A Booker. Marin Hassinger, M A R R E N H A S S I N G E R. And Barbara Chase Rabode. I think R I B O U D is mm -hmm. the spelling of her last name. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, John Otter, Ar Outer Bridge, O U T T E R Bridge, Outer Bridge, John Outer Bridge, and Doris Salcedo. Doris, as you can spell Doris and Salcedo, S A L C E D O. And Jorge Luis Rodriguez, Jorge J O R G E uh, L U I S, and Rodriguez. And um, Nick Cave. Uh, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, for Nick Cave, uh, they just uh, revealed his new installation mm -hmm. at the Times Square station. It is absolutely stunning. So if you want to see Nick Cave's latest work, you can go there. And then Preston Singletary. And I think that's pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. But I just want to thank everyone in our audience. I want to thank the panelists for joining us. I want to thank International Sculpture Center. I think we had a very lively conversation today. <laughs> and if you have any more questions, please feel free you know, to stay behind, ask us questions. And I also want to give a special shout out to JJ Johnson and Field Trip who actually helped us this afternoon and have a wonderful lunch. So thank you very much. Gina? Gina? Is everything good? Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs>